Let's ask for the Lord's help. Lord, as we have just sung, we pray that your spirit would move in our midst, that you would take your word and plant it deep in us, that you would shape and fashion us. Lord, we know that you are sanctifying your people by your word. So Lord, we ask for attentive minds. Help us to focus. Help us to humbly receive your word. Lord, I pray that you would help me to faithfully proclaim the truth of your word. We pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, if you're looking for someone to come do some work, I think I know what you're looking for. You're looking for a workman who will come and do a great job, someone who will be uh, careful with all the details. You want a good workman, someone who is honest, someone who's hardworking, someone who will do the job right. What you're not looking for is a bad workman, someone who's lazy, someone who's unprepared, someone who is just winging it. Uh, No one wants someone to come and, and do work that is of such a low standard that they should be ashamed of their work. A few years ago, many years ago, I guess, when we were moving across the country to go to seminary, uh, I was considering the different options for the move. We could rent a truck, load it ourselves and do the thing. We could uh, rent one of those containers where they drop it off, we load it, and they pick it up and take it, and we unload it. Uh, or there's the, the full-on moving company. Uh, they do it all, right? They come, they pick up your stuff, they transport it across the country, they unload it. I was comparing the, the different options, got different estimates, And I was surprised to get an estimate from a a moving company that was actually similar to what it was going to cost for us to drive the truck ourselves. Uh, There was one catch. Uh, The delivery was a 10-day window. So instead of saying, you know, your stuff will arrive on the 7th, it it will arrive between the 7th and the 17th, and you just have to be available the whole time. Well, that was a little awkward, but I thought, man, let's go for it. This is great. We'll save ourselves the, the hassle of of doing all these things on our own. Well, the day came and and, uh, there was a big crew as they gathered all the stuff and they loaded the truck and they left. And as they drove away, so began the frustration. So soon after I received a message uh, that they had weighed our belongings and of course their estimate was way off and now it was gonna cost considerably more than what they had said. Of course, now they have all of my stuff. It's like hostage. So I I now have to pay uh, this new exorbitant price, which I was not excited about. Uh, Well, then I'm there on the other side of the country uh, living in an apartment with an air mattress, just an air mattress. Um, And on the 17th day, after the 10-day window, so 27 days of air mattress, finally the truck arrives. Not with a big crew, but with one grumpy truck driver who's supposedly going to unload it all into our home, who then wanted to charge us more because there were stairs, and uh, yeah, yeah, this, the story goes on and on. Um, to make things worse, several items were broken. Needless to say, we were not pleased. We were not happy customers. Um, I attempted to get some sort of refund. Come on, you've got to make things right here, and that cut rate company was not going to give me one dime back. Uh, In my frustration, I felt like the only thing I could do was to file a complaint with the Better Business Bureau. And when I went to do so, I discovered that they already had the lowest rating. So that's when I learned that before you hire someone, that's when you want to go find their rating. You want to, uh, to ask for their recommendations, right? You want to have someone who has glowing reviews, who has happy customers, uh, you want someone who knows what they're doing. Perhaps they, they're uh, accredited. Maybe they've passed a test. They've, they've shown that they are competent. I tell all that story because the text that we come to this morning contrasts two kinds of workmen in God's house. There are workmen who should be ashamed of themselves. And then there are workmen who were approved by God himself. As I read the text, I want you to look for the sharp contrast between the good workman and the bad workman. 
Now, the work that's being described is the teaching of God's word. So listen for the difference between the faithful teachers and the false teachers. Again, our text is 2 Timothy 2, beginning at verse 14. Hear now the word of the Lord. God's holy, perfect, inerrant, infallible word. Remind them of these things. Charge them before God not to quarrel about words, which does no good, but only ruins the hearers. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. But avoid irreverent babble, for it will lead people into more ungodliness. Their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, who have swerved from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already happened. They are upsetting the faith of some But God's firm foundation stands, bearing this seal. The Lord knows who are his. And let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. This is the word of the Lord. In this passage, Paul is emphasizing the importance of true words and the danger of false words. So let me summarize it for you. Here's the the whole sermon in one sentence. Faithful teachers keep the truth straight, while false teachers swerve away from the truth. And we need to know the difference. Look up to verse 2. So chapter 2, verse 2. Here's some of the context. Paul says, What you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Uh, That verse is perhaps the key verse of the letter of 2 Timothy. Paul says, Timothy, I've been entrusted with the gospel. I've entrusted it to you. It is your responsibility to entrust that gospel to faithful men who will then teach others. We want this to keep getting passed on again and again and again. This is the spread of Christianity. And what we have in our passage is instruction for these faithful men. This is what these teachers of God's word need to do. Paul here tells us uh, what these teachers are to do and what they must not do. It breaks into three sections. We have the faithful teachers described, especially in verses 14 and 15. The false teachers described in verses 16 to 18. And then in verse 19, Paul tells us what we should do with these teachings. So first... Faithful teachers. Verse 14 says, Remind them of these things. Charge them before God not to quarrel about words, which does no good, but only ruins the hearers. So these faithful men, they are being taught, they're being reminded of these things. What's he talking about? What things? Well, it's what he's just written about. So in the middle, the paragraph that comes... Uh, Just before this one, verses 8 to 13, Paul talks about the gospel. He says, remember Jesus Christ. Remember Jesus Christ in his perfect life. Remember his substitutionary death. Remember his glorious resurrection from the dead. Remember that Jesus is Savior and Lord and that he provides the forgiveness of sins that comes by faith alone. All who turn from their sin and trust in Jesus, they receive forgiveness. They are saved from the punishment that they deserve. Now, this is the good news, the gospel we've been singing of this morning. Now, this is the core teaching of the Bible. This is what we celebrate week after week, that even though we're sinners, God has made a way for us to be made into saints. It's glorious good news. It's the best news in the world. Paul begins by saying, remind the men of these things. The gospel is to be at the forefront of their mind. It should have their attention. Faithful teachers never lose sight of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But he has more to say. Notice there in verse 14, the second 
half, and charge them before God not to quarrel about words, which does no good, but only ruins the hearers. So they're supposed to focus on the gospel. They're not to quarrel about words. What exactly does that mean? Well, we're helped because in 1 Timothy, Paul uses the same exact phrase. So let me read from 1 Timothy 6. He says, if anyone teaches a different doctrine that does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, he is puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. He has an unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarrels about words which produce envy, dissension, slander, evil speculation, and constant friction among people who are depraved in mind and deprived of truth. So here we're, we're given some instruction on what these quarrels about words is. This is arguments that just don't need to be had. There are those who they just, they get all worked up about all kinds of things. They're already, they're always discussing and frustrated about this or that. And here these faithful teachers are being warned. You don't need to get caught up in all of these unnecessary controversies. You need to focus on the gospel. Faithful teachers keep the main thing, the main thing. They're not arguing about mere labels. They're not worked up about non-essentials. They focus on what really matters and they refuse to be distracted by the arguments of some. So there's the first two pieces of instruction. But there's more in verse 15. This seems to be the heart of the instruction. Look there. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. Paul is telling Timothy and the church what faithful teachers are to do, what they must do. He's making it extremely clear what a pastor's primary concern is. Did you catch it? Did you see what it was? Listen once more. What must pastors do? Here's what it says. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. It all comes down to that. The teachers of God's word must rightly handle the word of truth. To be unashamed, to be approved to God, one must rightly handle the word. Timothy, do your best to rightly handle the word of truth. Work hard to get the text of scripture right. Be diligent to accurately understand and clearly explain the word. The word of truth is is a way of referring to the scripture, to the word of God. Jesus prayed in John 17, verse 17, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. The writer of Proverbs tells us, every word of God proves true. So God's word is true, and a faithful teacher only teaches the truth. This phrase, the word of truth, is also used to refer to the summary of the teaching of the Bible, the gospel. So in Ephesians 1.13, we read, You heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. So Paul's point is this. The scripture, and specifically the gospel, must be handled with care. We need to be careful that this message does not get distorted or changed in any way. Faithful teachers are committed to precision, to accuracy, to getting the details of the text right. So this is what a church should look for in a pastor, someone who faithfully handles the word of God. Every church needs this. Every church should expect their pastor to teach the truth of Scripture, and especially the gospel, rightly, clearly, accurately. This is one of the major themes of 2 Timothy. He says, protect the message, guard the gospel. Do not allow it to be changed or distorted, altered in any way. No, protect that message and faithfully pass it on. Just as a good workman comes 
prepared with the right tools, with experience, and then works hard, is diligent to make sure that the job is done right, so the teacher of God's word must be diligent to study it so that he can accurately teach what it says. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. Word work is hard work. Word work is a precise work, a careful work, a work that needs attention to detail. Handling the word of God rightly requires a determination to stay on point, to explain and apply the word of God according to the author's intent and meaning. Timothy is not allowed to just play fast and loose with the text. He can't get up and just wing it. He can't just say something about God's word. God forbid, pastors as God's spokesmen must speak what God has revealed. That's it. This is why James warns, not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. In some respect, the, the job of a teacher of Scripture is much like a mail carrier. Their job is to deliver the message. They are not authorized to open up the letters and change the message. That, that, that's not it. A preacher must take the Word of God and explain it to his people, not say something else. The most important thing that a faithful teacher does is rightly handle the word of truth. Now, this phrase translated here as rightly handle comes from the Greek root word ortho. We get the words orthodontist and orthodoxy from it. It, it refers to what is straight, right? An orthodontist makes your teeth straight. Orthodoxy refers to that which is straight teaching. The same word is used in Proverbs 3.6. Familiar verse. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make straight your path. The faithful teacher makes straight the path to truth. He, he makes it clear, makes it obvious what God has said. Faithful teachers keep it straight. They get it straight, and they give it straight. That's what you should expect from anyone who teaches you God's word. Faithful teachers are to be orthodox in that their teaching lines up with the truth of God's word. Rightly handling scripture comes in two parts. God's word must be carefully understood and then clearly communicated. It needs to be accurately studied and then appropriately given to others taught. There's just two aspects. The student of God's word comes and learns this, and then that teacher then explains what he has learned himself. So, teaching God's word, the goal is not to be flashy or to be famous. The goal is simply to be faithful, to deliver the message that God has given. Christian preachers are responsible to rightly comprehend and explain the Bible. All teachers of Scripture are to be diligent to get it straight and give it straight. So that's what we need to know about faithful teachers. Faithful teachers keep the truth straight. But sadly, false teachers swerve away from the truth. You see that there in verses 16 to 18. Verse 16 says, But avoid irreverent babble. For it will lead people into more and more ungodliness. Their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, who have swerved from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already happened. They are upsetting the faith of some. He starts here in verse 16 by saying, Timothy, this is what not to do. I'm now showing you the negative example. You must avoid irreverent babble, have nothing to do with such words. And again, we go, well, what exactly does that mean? Irreverent babble. And again, we're helped because he's used this phrase back in 1 Timothy. This is how he ends the letter. The last two verses of 1 Timothy say this. 
O Timothy, guard the deposit entrusted to you. Avoid the irreverent babble and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. For by professing it, some have swerved from the truth. So what is this irreverent babble? (laughs) It's, It's nonsense that is spoken in the name of God that is not what God has actually said. It's false teaching. It's that which is contrary to the word of God. Notice the fruit that comes from this irreverent babble. What does this produce? You see it there in verse 16. Avoid irreverent babble, for it will lead people into more and more ungodliness. Their talk will spread like gang green. Oh, what a horrible image here. There are some who they keep spewing words, and their words are leading others astray, leading them to live lives of sin, lives of ungodliness. Oh, you don't need to bother with the commands of God. Oh, people like to hear that. It appeals to their flesh. And so it spreads. It's It's a contagion. But it's a deadly, deadly contagion. False teaching spreads and it needs to be stopped. And so that's what's dealt with here in the text. Look again at verse 17. Their talk will spread like gangrene. And now he gives some examples. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, who have swerved from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already happened, upsetting the faith of some. Notice they're described as those who swerve from the truth. We've got the faithful teacher. He, he stays on the straight and narrow path of truth. But the false teacher, he swerves off into the ditch of error into falsehood. He veers away. Instead of just staying with what God has said, he, he, he updates it. He, he makes it more modern or progressive or whatever. He changes the message. And by that distorting of God's word, he then deceives others. So what do we do with these things? We're quickly here given the description of a faithful teacher, and a false teacher. A false teacher heading astray. Let's deal first with the particular example he mentions there. Look at verse 18. They've swerved from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already happened. Well, yes, the resurrection of Christ has happened, but I think this is a reference to our resurrection. Now, think of the implications here. If someone is saying, oh, we've already all been resurrected. We've already been perfected. We are what we were ultimately meant to be. It would mean that this world is as good as it's going to get. That this is the experience of the new resurrected, perfected life. But of course, that's not the teaching of Scripture. We have not yet been resurrected. We're not in the new heavens and the new earth. We're not yet perfected. No, we have much to wait for. You see how that would upset the faith of some. What? You're you're saying we've already arrived? This this doesn't seem like it at all. This is one of the distortions. There's so, so many, numerous ways in which people just veer off from the word of God. It says here that it's upsetting the faith of some. Uh, False teaching always leads to to doubt, leads to, to trouble. We've seen that faithful teachers keep it straight, while false teachers swerve away from the truth. We need to know the difference. So when we get to verse 19, we start seeing how we are to respond to these different kinds of teaching. Again, verse 18 ends by saying, they are upsetting the faith of some. Now verse 19, but God's firm foundation stands, bearing this seal. The Lord knows those who are his. And let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. Paul here gives great encouragement. I know there's this false teaching out there, but God's firm foundation stands. He's saying God's church will endure. God will preserve the faith of his people. Christians, by all means, should avoid false teaching. We should run away from false teachers. But don't for a minute think that false teaching is going to cause the church to crumble. By no means. False teachers don't have that much power. God will protect his people, his word, his truth. But that doesn't mean there isn't 
real danger out there. Now, he says, God's firm foundation stands with a seal. And then he gives us these two quotes. The Lord knows those who are his. And let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. Let's just deal with that first one for a moment. The Lord knows who are his. Think of what that means in this context. You've got these faithful teachers and you have these false teachers. And we're told, don't worry, the Lord knows who are his. That is an encouraging reality on so many levels. In some respect, it reminds us of what Jesus said. In John 10, he said in verse 14, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and they know me. And yet I don't think that's exactly what's going on here. He's not quoting Jesus. He's actually quoting from Numbers 16. If you're doing a Bible reading, perhaps you just read it recently here. Numbers 13, I'm not going to read the whole chapter for you, but I do want to remind you of what's here. It's the account of Korah's rebellion. Korah gathered 250 others with him and said, we reject the authority of Moses and Aaron. Uh, We are all holy. We're all equal. We're all on the same level. How dare you raise yourself up, Moses? How dare you, Aaron, act as if you speak for God? We all speak for God. Uh, This is the the argument. Well, this is how Moses responds. Moses says, the Lord knows who are his. And in the morning, the Lord will make known who are his. He's going to show it. He's going to make it plain and obvious who who is his authorized spokesman and who is not. I do want to read a little bit for you. So in verse 26, we read this. And he spoke to the congregation. So he had talked to the rebels. Now he speaks to the people. He spoke to the congregation saying, Depart, please, from the tents of these wicked men. Touch nothing of theirs, lest you be swept away with all their sins. He says, you don't speak for God, and God's going to make that plain. He turns to the congregation and says, all right, you have to choose. Are you with them or are you against them? He calls them to leave them. Depart from their sins iniquity. Leave, separate yourself from these false teachers. Then here's what happens. Verse 31. As soon as he had finished speaking all these words, the ground under them split apart. The earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up and their households and all the people who belonged to Korah and all their goods so that they and all that belonged to them went down alive into Sheol, the place of the dead. And the earth closed over them, and they perished from the midst of the assembly. Whoa. Yes, the Lord knows who are his. He made it quite clear. Here's these ones. Oh, no, no, no. We don't have to have the authority of Moses and Aaron. And God just said, whoop, and they're done. Right? I mean, whoa. The earth opens up, swallows it up, closes back up. No wonder. He said, depart from them. Don't go near those guys. Okay, so that's what happens in number 16. Let's go back to our text and notice what Paul is doing. He's just taught about the faithful teacher and the false teacher and said, congregation, people of God, you need to know the difference. He says, God's foundation stands firm, bearing this seal. The Lord knows who are his and let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. I think what he's done here is he's quoted from the beginning of that account, and then he's alluded to that statement at the end. Depart, separate yourselves from the tent of the wicked. He's drawing attention to what happened with Korah's rebellion to make a point. Now let's make sure we understand the point. We know what happened there. What's he saying here? The Lord, he will make known those who are really his teachers. How will he do it? (laughs) Because they stick to the word. They're faithful to the word. It will become obvious and plain to everyone. And yet, even though the Lord will make it clear and preserve his church, his people, they are called to separate themselves from iniquity, to separate themselves from false teaching and false teachers. God will indeed preserve his church. He will preserve his word. But brothers and sisters, we must keep our distance from those who would teach what is 
contrary, what is false, what is not true. We want to have nothing to do with those who would claim an authority for themselves to speak on behalf of God, but then to say something else other than what God has said. We must depart from their iniquity. We must separate ourselves from their sin and wickedness. We must hold on to what is good and shun what is evil. So here's what we've seen this morning. The workman who has no reason to be ashamed, who is approved by God himself, is the one who rightly handles the word of God and does not swerve away from it. We don't need to be creative and innovative and new. We need to be faithful to what the word has said. So let's think through some different ways this applies. In the household of God, only faithful teachers should be allowed. In the church, you should expect your pastor to give it to you straight. So let me be really blunt. If I'm teaching false doctrine, you should fire me. Get rid of anyone who is teaching what is false. No church should tolerate false teaching. We must separate ourselves from deceivers. Likewise, we must make sure that what we're being taught is actually true. You must be like the Bereans and check the scripture for yourself to see if these things are really so. That's how we apply this corporately, but this applies in so many other areas as well. Every teacher of God's word needs to keep it straight. So from pastors to parents, to people who are talking to their coworkers or teaching a class, if you're explaining God's word, you need to do so rightly, precisely, accurately. Don't wing it. Teach exactly what God has said. Be careful in handling God's word. We need to understand the truth of God's word, and then we need to share it with others. You notice that there's hearers here. He described those who are teaching, and here they must carefully handle the word because what they do affects others. Brothers and sisters, may we pass on the message faithfully to our children, to our neighbors, to the next generation. I love the encouragement of verse 19. God's firm foundation stands, bearing this seal. The Lord knows who are his. And let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. Brothers and sisters, let us hold fast to what is true and forsake what is false. Let's pray together. Your word is truth. We are so thankful for the truth that has been given to us. And Lord, we recognize the seriousness of handling your word. Lord, help us all to be careful, to study, to understand your word. Help us reject what is false and hold on to what is true. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.